Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Acts chapter 13. What we're going to do, we're going to take a few minutes, look into the Word of God, and then we're going to have the Lord's table. For those of you that are visiting, we don't have what's called closed communion here. We have close communion. In other words, you might not be a member, but if you, before the Lord, are right with God, you are walking with him, you've been saved, scripturally baptized by immersion, and you are right with the Lord, then you are welcome to join us. After that, we're going to have Tim and Megan come and have Tim over here and Megan over here, and we'll have the men over here and the ladies over here. And we're going to pray over them. We're going to ask God to work in their life, as in their lives as he really has already done. But then also that he would meet their needs and we would be an encouragement to them. It's a joy to have them here. They are living on the church property in the parsonage. They live there rent free. We pay the insurance there. We pay for the utilities and we do it gladly because we want to support them. Let's take a few minutes and we'll look into the word. Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we continue in this time, I ask that you would work. Lord, thank you for this young couple that have given themselves to you. Lord, I pray now that we would recognize not only their ministry, but ours as well. Do this work, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. You know, we have an interesting time in our nation right now. It's been interesting and it's been fascinating, and I praise God for this, that we have been able to be involved in, for instance, over at the Capitol, that we have the two-minute warning, that we have been able to see God work greatly through the RU program, that we have seen by God's grace, see people saved. By the way, I want you to pray. Uh, yesterday evening, I was over here and just kind of finishing things up and um, went to witness to uh, one of the gentlemen that lives next door. He's 53 years old. He just had a heart attack a few weeks ago. According to his sister, uh, he could have died. He doesn't know the Lord. Had a good time talking to him. I gave him one of our tracks. Uh, what do we all have in common? But we need to pray for him. His name is Merlin. He, they, ha they have watched out for our property here. I'm glad for that. But he needs to know. He needs to know the Lord. But there's so many things that we see that are going on in this nation. There's all kinds of animosity on several, uh, on several fronts. It's, we're not getting along as a nation anymore, but the thing that I'm really concerned about is there's confusion with God's people. Let, let, me, let me give you a for instance. George Barna, in surveying over 65,000 people, came up with this. More Americans, excuse me, most Americans, including young adults, believe the Bible has been more influential on humanity than any other text? I would say yes, absolutely, especially the Western culture. A majority believe the Bible contains everything a person needs to know in order to live a meaningful life. And again, to us, we would agree. Two-thirds of all Americans, this was amazing to me, Two-thirds of all Americans hold to an orthodox view of the Bible that it is the actual or inspired word of God. And all God's people said, Amen. it's God's word. Nearly half, 
half read the Bible at least once per month. That was people that they got in contact with, Christian, non-Christian, whoever. In fact, there is an app, and there are several apps. Some of you may have several apps on your phone, on your iPad, whatever tablet that you use, that has study material on it. Uversion is one of them. And they recently came out and said in a 28-day period, people just in the United States, this is not overseas, just in the United States, used Uversion, that one app, to access translations in 554 languages. 554 and requested over half a billion chapters. There are people that are looking to see what does the Bible say. And again, the material that I just read here about what Christians say. But even with this, this is the thing that, that concerns me. There are God's people that will say, yes, that's right, amen, I agree, this is God's word, this is the Bible. You preach it, I'll turn the pages. But now wait a minute. When they were talking to Christians directly, Barna found this. 76% of practicing Christians, 76% believe the best way to find yourself is to look within yourself. Excuse me, book, chapter, and verse, please. 76% said people should not criticize someone else's life choices. Now, by the way, when it comes to criticism, we just don't come out and criticize, but there is such a thing that says, thus saith the Lord, amen? For those of you that are visiting, it's okay to say amen here. Amen? There we go. 67% say the highest goal in life. Now, again, this is, these are practicing Christians. 67% say the highest goal in life is to enjoy it as much as possible. I, me and the teenagers just looked at this this morning. We looked at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Amen? Listen, we, we've got a disconnect here. The sad thing is, is there are people that will open up God's Word on Sunday. And the fact of the matter is, Monday through Saturday, it doesn't have the impact on their cultural view. They've got a cultural view that is not a biblical worldview. And therein is the challenge. When it comes to politics, when it comes to culture, when it comes to life in general, God's people are to have a view that is born out of God's Word, out of the mind of God. We are to get into the Word of God. We are to study the Word of God. We are to learn the Word of God. And we are to give ourselves not only to the Word of God, but to the God of the Word. But there's a disconnect. And this is not right. And the sad fact is it gets worse. 61% of these people, again, 61% of people that profess to be born again, bought by the blood of the Lamb, 61% say people can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. Tell that to the three Hebrew children that said, we're not going to bow. Tell that to Daniel, you know, for that matter. Tell that to the disciples. Tell that to the millions of God's people who have lived down through the centuries, who have lived out what we read in Hebrews chapter 11, who have recognized that, you know what? We ought to obey God rather than man. There's a challenge. And this is the challenge that the generation that is growing into leadership and even is in leadership in so many churches, this is the challenge that they are part of. This is why it was kind of shocking to read in one particular situation, a major Bible college in California 
to read the chaplain of that college say, you know, there are some things about what people are saying from the LGBT community that, you know, we can really cozy up to and agree with. I read the entire article. He was wrong. We love these people. We do. We give them the gospel. We point them to 1 Corinthians 6, where they recognize that, you know what? There were people that, you know, they were outside of Christ. And then Paul says, and such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're clean. But there are Christians that are not wanting to make waves. They're saying, okay, well, you know, whatever you want. 61% say they can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. Tell that to people that are not believers, and they are looking us in the eye like they have at the Capitol, and they have stared us down. And they've said, no. I've told them, you don't have a constitution. You've got an agenda, don't you? And that's exactly what's going on. And that's the culture of today. People are looking at the Word of God, including professing Christians. Does it get worse? Yes. They found that 40%, and, and, and this is sad, folks, 40% of these people that claim to be born-again Christians, 40% say any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. Whatever happened to thou shalt not commit adultery? Now, now listen. We can look at Tim and Megan and go, praise God, have at it. They're going to be going to people that are going to be daring them to preach God's word. There will be people in here that will come in. In the last days, perilous times shall come. By the way, that doesn't mean that we can't have revival. Let the perilous times come. Hey, let me tell you something. There was a group of preachers here, Friday morning, 7 a.m., Tim got them together. We are looking for, by God's grace, we are looking for several churches. I don't know how many. We'll get as many as we can. Several churches to lay aside the pride, lay aside our own little particular thing. Well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to be a blessing to that church. We need blessing. No, 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 no. Listen, we got here, and I'm telling you, I wish you could have been here because we prayed for over an hour. And I mean, the tears flowed, and God, we begged him, Lord, show us. We want your will. We want a citywide campaign. How many of you would love to see revival come to Sacramento? Come on, let's talk about it. It's starting, and it's starting right here. And the next time we get together is going to be September 28th. There's going to be pastors, and there will be people. If you want to come and pray and see God do a work, because as far as I'm concerned, the place that is needing to have revival in America is not Los Angeles, where I grew up, not New York, not Washington, because the fact of the matter is, as California goes, so goes the nation. As the nation goes, for the most part, so goes the world. And this is the place where the politicians gather, where they make the laws. This place, Sacramento, we want a place that will impact not only the politicians, but the people in Sacramento. That's what is needed. And you know what we wind up going back to? That good old friend called unbelief that says one way or another, oh, it just can't happen. You ask, you ask Pastor John Evertson, who was here, and David Welch, and Tim, and myself, and Dennis Blankenship, hey, and, and there's going to be other pastors that are going to be joining us next month. Folks, we either do it or die. God does not owe anything to America. How many of us recognize that? He doesn't. Are you kidding? The tens of millions of babies that have been slaughtered in the womb, and now we've got Christians that are going, well, you know, that's, I mean, you know, everybody's got their own choice. You know, they've got their idea. Excuse me? 
the slaughter of innocents? We best be careful. We best be careful. I want to show you just three things real quick. Three things real quick. We're dealing with a remarkable church here. Look at verse 1. A remarkable church. There are five men that are listed here. What's fascinating, by the way, is four of these are Hellenists. In other words, they are Jews, either converted or they, were, they grew up Jewish, that were, out, that were born outside of the nation. This is Antioch. This is where Christians were first called Christians. They're Christians. They are, they, 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 people looked at them and they said, you must be a follower of Jesus. You're like him. You've got the same, you, you, you remind us of him when we heard him a long time ago. You have the essence of him. This is the place where he was first, where people, again, people who followed Christ were first called Christians. Look at this. First of all, there's Barnabas, the son of consolation. I'm just going to go through these quickly. The son of consolation, the compassionate man, the man who is compassionate not only to God's people and selling all that he had and giving his money, but also he was compassionate about Saul, who would later be Paul, because when the people were afraid of him, he says, no, 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 you've got to hear what God has done in his life. Not only was there Barnabas, but there's Simeon that was called Niger. This is fascinating because there are real possibilities here. Now, again, this is not set in stone, but there are some people that believe that this Simeon here was Simon, the one who carried the cross for Christ. Now, there are reasons why, and, I, and I'm not going to go into that. But it says Simon that was called Niger. That word Niger means black. Here is a man who very possibly, in other parts of the Scripture, it speaks of him as Simon of Cyrene. So here was a man that was most likely black. He had come. He is now in the church at Antioch, called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, possibly from the same country, because this man, he went back and he told his people about Christ, and here comes Lucius. And then Menean. Here's a man that was literally brought up as a foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch. The same one, the same one that grew up to steal his brother's wife, that murdered, stop and think about this. <laughs> Here's Manan, and he had ministry. Here's a man that became a king, but he was a murderer. Here was a man that embraced Christ. Here's a man that embraced corruption. They, brought up, they were literally brought up as brothers, but instead... One went this way to Jesus. The other, they just wanted precious stuff. Yeah, they, they want, you know, anything I can get my hands on, even if I have to steal it. I want to mention just one thing. This is fascinating. About Simon Niger. In Mark chapter 15, verse 21, when they talk about, when they talk about Simon, and they talk about carrying Christ's uh, cross, it says, Mark 15, 21, and they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. There is speculation that the reason why Mark mentioned Alexander and Rufus, his sons, is because they were known in the church. That's why they start bringing these things together and thinking, you know what, this is very possibly that him. that's him. This is the one that he has mentioned in Acts chapter 13 because Paul mentions Simon, Simeon, and his mother and I, she's speaking about the sons. Just real quick on that. Next, I want you to see, because I want to get through this, this is the Apostle Paul as well, and he's the one that had all the gifts. So here are people. He mentions five. Two of them are black. Two of them are going to be sent out. 
It's like losing an arm and a leg. I would love to have this young couple here, by the way, all the time. But we can't do it. When they first got here, they did. And now they're actually disobeying the Lord. They're just thinking that they have this call. It's just, no. But I praise God for what he's doing in their life. I want you to see next. This is us now, folks. A responsive church. Look at verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord, what were they doing? It wasn't just the five, it was other people. They're fasting, they're praying, they're seeking God's will. They are ministering to him in coming before him in worship. And the Lord speaks. Now we've known what the Lord is going to do with Tim. We have watched him grow. You know, he talks about when he was a teenager. I'll never forget. Here he was shy, and he was shy. Oh, my soul, was he shy. And then somebody took him out soul winning. And that was it. That was it. That changed him. And he wants God's will. By the way, praise God for people that want people for God. Amen? Amen. There's a work that we have all been called to, this local fellowship. It's a great time to recognize, you know, there are people that are in need. There are people that are hurting. They need counseling. There are people that need the Lord, and there are people that need help because of the calling that God has placed on their life. And like Tim said, we're, they're, and Megan, they're called out of this church. Now they'll come back as we will find out tonight, because there's this thing called the two-minute warning. And everybody talks about not just the preaching and the praying, but the food, right? And so the ladies are thinking, oh man, if we had 300 people here, it's okay, God will meet the need. I keep talking about that food and I'm going to get hungry. I keep thinking about the tri-tip. But listen, this is why we're here. We are the responsive church. When they have a calling on their life, like Antioch, we go, you know what? That's our responsibility as well. So we're helping them. By the way, we're going to be sending a letter out to a lot of different churches and saying, hey, would you consider possibly helping Tim and Megan? They have taken a step of faith. You stop and think about it. Megan had a good job over at 7 Up, and she has stepped away from that. They are now living on what God's people provide as they go out and minister. A responsive church, hey, we're seeing them set aside, and we're going to be praying over them. But now I want you to see a ready church for a needy culture. Look at verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Which brings me to this. There's an awakening that we need. God's people need revival everywhere, including this place. We are so close. We're so close to the Lord taking us home. How many of you have recognized that? If the Lord doesn't take us home yet, do you realize what is happening here in America? Government will not save us. Government has never saved anybody. Jesus Christ saves. If people don't have Jesus Christ, if the foundations are destroyed because they have been let go, then what is going to take place is all this will crumble and next thing you know, it really will come about what William Penn said. If we will not be governed by God, we must be governed by tyrants. No political party has the answer. None. No political party has the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to know him. And you need to know him desperately. I have some other material that I'd like to go to, but we don't have the time right now.